when you run an ultra marathon, fellow runners are very encouraging to you. This is something you need to know. When you're passing someone on the trails, or in my case, when you're being passed by someone on the trails, it always involves a volley of grunting encouragements. You know, keep it up! <laughs> you're doing great! Awesome work! Or you got this! Or my personal favorite, looking good when I know clearly I am most definitely not looking good at all. Uh, one of the uh, beautiful aspects about trail running, uh, the culture of trail running, is how super encouraging people are to each other. You're coming alongside someone who is struggling and you try to give them some kind of boost. You know, don't quit, you're doing awesome. Or you find someone struggling, sitting by the trail, and they're looking just wasted. And, you, you know, you're, are you okay, dude? You know, do you need some electrolytes? Do you need some energy chews? Do you need a kick? I mean, do you need uh, boost, uh, food? You know, whatever it needs. And then uh, it really is obvious when, when runners get hurt, they maybe fall down and hurt themselves badly. There's always people offering first aid. There's people waiting with them if they have to be taken off the trail or maybe just waiting with them until they can get going again. Um, this is really, really common. On, on the most difficult leg of the death race, uh, for me, I spent quite a bit of time uh, grunting through my own despair and agony. It was right around the time when I heard my right big toenail go pop, and I knew it was coming off. Yep, right at that moment. I, I also was encouraging a young woman who was performing a series of pass puke, pass puke uh, leapfrogs. You know what that is? So she'd fly past me going downhill, and I was hobbling along like an old man. And, um, uh, but a few moments later, I'd find her bent over puking on the side of the trail, and I'd see if she's okay, if she needed anything, and offer her some you know, heartening words. But she's like, keep going, keep going. So I'm going, and then a little while later, woof, she goes past me again, and I shout a little bit of encouragement. But it wasn't too long, and I'd catch up to her, bent over again in agony, puke past, puke. Pat, doesn't trail running on a hot day in August on steep terrain just sound like the kind of thing you want to get into? <laughs> Lots of encouragements needed. I'm very thankful for my fellow runners, but especially uh, on the death race for my uh, amazing crew that came out to support me uh, along the way. Uh, there, there they are there. But encouragement, it turns out, in trail running isn't just about helping people keep going the way that they are intending to go. Sometimes encouragement involves calling people back onto the right path. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was running the Black Spur Ultra in Kimberly, and I watched this runner heading off to the right, and he was going. Like, I couldn't have caught him if I tried, but I'm looking at the trail flags, which are down to the left, and I'm thinking, is that just a local Kimberly resident out for a run on the mountain? Probably not. And so I'm like, hey, you know, you, hey, and I'm shouting, you know, the flags, the flags, and he's gone. And I'm kind of wondering, oh, I wonder what happened to him. But a few minutes later, he caught up to us and said, hey, was one of you shouting at me? I'm like, yeah, thanks, man. I can't believe I missed those flags. And then he was gone. I never saw him again. <clears throat> Encouragement, in his case, was also about warning him that he was heading off on the wrong trail so he could backtrack and get onto it. Because when the race gets difficult, or when the bile begins to rile, we don't just need encouragement to keep going. We need encouragement when we're heading off in the right, wrong direction. We need encouragement even more. And as it turns out, the Bible commands us to do just that for each other. We're told over and over and over again to encourage one another. That it's actually one of the primary ways that we relate to one another. We speak to one another. We support one another. We pray for one another. We help one another in this, dare I say, Christian ultramarathon. Any toenails popping recently? <laughs> Sometimes these commands to encourage are given for a specific reason. Uh, take one example in 1 Thessalonians 4.18. A fellow Christians are struggling with how uh, people in their community are dying. And they're struggling with the death of those they love. And they were told in that specific case, the Apostle Paul tells them to encourage one another with these truthful words about the resurrection hope that is true because of Jesus and will come true fully when Jesus comes again. Uh, faced with responsibility for a local church, Paul tells a young pastor to, I love this, encourage young men to be self-controlled. 
Is that relevant today? I'm not sure. Um, well, in another letter, Paul himself encourages two women leaders who are struggling to get along. Also, I'm sure not relevant today, but struggling to get along to be of the same mind for the sake of the kingdom work. Whether it applied to specific situations, and there's lots of that, or whether it was applied more generally, the New Testament is sprinkled with repeated encouragements to encourage one another. And the underlying uh, Greek word means to come or call alongside someone. It, and it gets translated actually into a variety of English words like exhorting, calling, urging, pleading, begging, comforting, and of course, encouraging, probably most commonly translated that way, but it's simply all over the place in the New Testament, well over a hundred times. That's why I say it surfaces one of the primary ways that we actually relate to one another and support one another and get alongside each other and call out to each other so we can all keep going or even be worn back onto the right path so we can keep going. Uh, I'm going to sprinkle, this is all pulled from Scripture. We're told to, quote, encourage and build each other up with the truth of who Jesus is. Uh, we're told in another place to encourage one another in sound doctrine. Uh, we're told in uh, another place to encourage the disheartened. Uh, to those who've been given the spiritual gift of encouragement, some of you have, you know. I prayed with someone the other day who I know is gifted with the gift of encouragement because every time she prays for me, I feel like a million bucks. I feel like I'd go and run, run an ultra marathon again, even though I'm sure I would not be able to. Uh, I, that's how I feel because this person is gifted with encouragement. If you've got the gift of encouragement, Romans 12 says, use it to encourage other people. Uh, use it to the fullest of the gift that God's given you. Uh, pastors are in one place are told to, quote, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. In another place, they're told to encourage and rebuke with all authority. Um, elders of the church, we're told, must, I'm quoting, must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that they can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Uh, Paul closes his second letter to the uh, troublesome Christians in Corinth with these words, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of, san be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Commands are everywhere. But more than just commands, there's a bunch of examples of it too. Early in the book of Acts, very famously, a man named Joseph practiced sacrificial generosity by looking at his holdings and thinking, I don't need that extra land. So he sells land to support the poor through the church, and he was nicknamed the son of encouragement, or Barnabas, because of his supportive and selfless character. And this wasn't a one-off or a passing fad. This was the man who asked after the Saul, this uh, murderous Saul, was now following the Messiah, and he's out there, and, 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 and Barnabas hears about this, and he's, he's interacting with this new Christian community in Antioch, and he thinks, I need somebody to help me, and he thinks of Saul. And he goes and gets Saul. People aren't quite willing to trust this guy yet, but he brings him along. He brings him back on the mission. He gets him going. He supports him in this new commission that he's been given, and he becomes a fellow missionary along with him. It's because of Barnabas' gift of encouragement that we have most of this New Testament. Changed the course of history. And then we see others often referred sometimes a little cryptically. You know the end of the letters? We often kind of skip over all these weird Greek, Roman names, and you hear about this. But at the end of letters that Paul would write, he would often say, I'm sending Tychicus to you. I'm sending Timothy to you. And the purpose for which he'd send these guys out was specifically to encourage. He would say it, to encourage you, these far-flung believers, to encourage them in their faith, to encourage them to keep going. Keep persevering. Keep running the race that's been set before them in the face of all the cultural pressures and the church struggles that often would discourage them. I could go on and on and on, but you get the point. As God's people, we are called, we're commissioned, we're commanded to encourage one another. Welcome to the One Great Big Church series. This is all happening all this fall, but here in the middle of September, we're kicking off with a focus on who we are as God's people, who we are as the church, not just here at the Erickson Covenant Church, but recognizing that we're part of the one great big church across this valley, but across this world. 
The church of Jesus Christ as brothers and sisters spread across culture, across language, across denomination, across nation, or down through the generations, sometimes called the communion of saints, that we've got family everywhere and through all time. We talked about this. What does it mean for us to be the one great big church of Jesus? It means that we're a family that's been created by God the Father through his son Jesus the Messiah and filled with the Holy Spirit. God is dwelling in his people so that we now make up one new humanity, Paul calls it, a new group, an eternal family that's not divided by societal or cultural sins but united in the love of God. And what's this one great big church like? Last week we explored the first mark of the church, that God's people are devoted to each other, that we are for one another, that we have this orientation toward one another, and we're eager to honor one another, that we're present to each other, that we're participating in the worship of God and the mission of God together, that we're praying with and for each other. That was last week. It's online. It's on YouTube. Please catch it up if you missed it. This week, we're looking at the second defining characteristic of the one great big church, and that is that God's people encourage one another. That is, because we are devoted to one another, because we are showing up in one another's lives and shouldering the load together, we take seriously our responsibility to help each other keep following Jesus on the way he's leading us. That I am responsible to encourage you that you are responsible to encourage me, that we are responsible to God the Father who made us, to Jesus who died for us, to the Holy Spirit who lives in us. We are responsible to God to actually encourage one another. This is a serious responsibility. In the words of the letter to the Hebrews, We're supposed to consider how we may spur one another on. I love that image. Toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together. In other words, not deciding, well, I can be part of the church. I can can love my brothers and sisters, but never show up. Never be present to them. Impossible. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. Being there with each other. Being beside and with and for. And so here's the question I have for you. How would you view your role in the family of God, in the body of Christ, specifically in this church, because this is where we are, how would you view your role if you fully embraced your responsibility to encourage your brothers and sisters? How would your engagement here as we gather as the church on Sunday mornings? How would your engagement change if you understood that your primary ministry call, and it doesn't matter where you might be specifically serving. It doesn't matter if you're serving on the tech team or serving back in children's ministry or helping make coffee with the hospitality dream team, or you're just here on Sunday morning to worship and and encourage together. If you understood that your primary uh, ministry call is to actually encourage one another. That you came in here this morning and said, my job today is to encourage someone. How would that change your engagement as you gather, as we gather on Sundays? How would your personal purpose change throughout the week if you saw as a responsibility that God has given to you, along with your daily work and your household chores and your chosen hobbies and your dirty laundry and your drives back and forth from town, that you're also responsible to look for ways to encourage a brother or a sister in Christ? How would that change your weekly purpose? Because here's the amazing thing. Every single one of you, without any exception, Man, woman, teenager, sick, stuck at home, healthy, mobile, student, rich, poor, handy, handsome, or somewhere in between, every single one of you, without exception, can actually be a real encourager to other people. Do you know that? You can actually take on this ministry of encouragement and make it happen. In fact, if you are a follower of Jesus, you're actually required to take this command. There's enough of them hanging around. This command to encourage one another, you're actually required to take it seriously so that you live it out in your daily life. Every single one. So how might your self-understanding 
your purpose in life, your participation in the life of the Erickson Covenant Church, your relationships to fellow brothers and sisters who are part of other local church fellowships. How might that shift if you woke up in the morning and asked, Lord, who needs encouragement today? Say it with me. Lord, who needs encouragement today? Try it one more time. Say it like that guy. Lord, who needs encouragement today? That question. As you're brushing your teeth. I don't think that guy shaves as often as some of us do, but who needs encouragement today? This is very interesting because the word encourage uh, that's often used to translate, uh, you know, or it's, it's the English word that a lot of translators grab to explain this Greek word that means coming alongside, calling alongside. It's actually an English word that comes from an old French word. I can't pronounce French very well, but it's something like encourager. And it means to make strong or to hearten or to put the heart into. And you can see how it comes into English, right? The core the core, as in cour de laine, you know, the core in French, as in courage and encourage, it's all there. It's, it's from the French word for heart. So to en encourage someone is to put the heart into someone. I, I like this a lot. I like that metaphor. When I think of encouragement, if I think of it as I, I, I'm walking around trying to put the heart into people. Doesn't that, doesn't that just sing a little bit better? The word encourage is kind of, uh, maybe it gets old for us, but what if you started walking around and thinking, how do I put the heart into people? That we make each other strong by putting the heart into each other for the life that God has given us to live. That we put the heart into each other for the service that God has called us into with the gifts that he's given to us by his spirit. That we go around every day with the goal of putting the heart into him or her. Making each other stronger for the work of the Lord. Stronger in the faith that's been delivered to us down through the generations. Stronger in the hope of God's good work ahead. Both in our lives, but also in the generations to come that go beyond our lives here. We put the heart in each other. Just, just work with me. Think about that. I should have made little hearts that went around and just wanted to give them to people, but think of that image of putting the heart into someone. That we make each other stronger in faith, hope, and love. So much of that is about our focus and our attention and our engagement with each other. What would it look like if we focused our energy on putting the heart into one another? You know, last week uh, we considered um, what it might look like for us to be eager to honor one another as an expression of, of our devotion for one another. Like, well, how would that change our community life? How would that change the nature of our relationships? How would that help us get over some of the things that keep us apart? If I actually took seriously the, this, this idea, this call of Scripture, that I would be eager to honor you. And you're eager to honor me. Like, what would that look like? That'd be crazy. Well, add to this now the idea that not only am I eager to honor you, but I really want to put the heart in you too. What a dynamic combo. A community so devoted to one another, eager to honor one another, that they're just dreaming up ways of putting the heart into each other. Right? It would change everything. It would change our lives. As we've already seen, there's a kind of a biblical range to this encouragement. It's weighted most heavily in the keep going category, the cheer it up category, the you can do it category, but it also includes this watch out or remember or stop that or what are you doing? It, it can include, that's the kind of the range of uh, the biblical word encourage. But I'd like to suggest that our encouragement of each other takes at least three forms. First, we encourage each other to be who we are in Christ. That includes reminding each other of what we know is true because of Jesus, because of what he's done, but it also includes confronting lies that we've been believing about ourselves that deny the truth of who we are in Christ. 
Paul talks about his goal for the Colossian Christians in Colossians 2. He says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. So they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We encourage each other by teaching each other what is true, by discipling each other, yes. But so much of what it means to encourage one another to be who we are in Christ is about reminding each other of what we already know is true. I've said this to many of you, I know, that I think so much of what we need to do to mutually encourage one another, like maybe 99%, is actually just reminding each other what we already know is true. I have a very forgetful mind. Do you? It is helpful for me to have brothers and sisters who go, yeah, but let's remember who Jesus has made us to be. Let's remember what he's done. Let's, let's not forget this life is all about the kingdom or whatever it might be. Being reminded of who we are in Christ because everything else flows from our identity. Knowing who we are in Christ, who Jesus is and what he has done, how he has made us part of God's family, everything flows from that identity. So the first thing, we encourage each other to be who we are in Christ. Second, we encourage each other to live as we've been called, which, yes, includes that keep going aspect, but also there's times where we might challenge each other on what's inconsistent with that calling. Paul, again, uh, encourages uh, the Ephesian Christians when he said that he, as a prisoner in the Lord, he's in jail at the time when he's writing this, he urges them, exhorts them, the same word in Greek, it's encourage you to live a life worthy of the calling with which you were called. This is about remembering that one of the ways we put the heart into each other is by helping each other remain focused on what truly matters, to embrace our true calling as God's people with the gifts and the potentiality, with the heart, soul, mind, and strength that God has called us to put into our lives, to focus everything upon in the short window of time we have called life, that we focus it on the life worthy of the calling we've received. Because we get so bogged down so distracted and drifting, and we need each other urging us on. We need each other to, to exhort and challenge, to, to, to beg and plead, to urge and persuade that we would continue to live as we've been called to live, as the holy, commissioned, spirit-filled people of God, part of an eternal kingdom, and serving an eternal king. Third, we encourage each other to continue to trust God's goodness. This is especially true when life gets hard, and we're tempted to quit. Hebrews chapter 10, we've already heard it, but there's this call to consider and, and to be intentional about connecting with each other so that we can encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the next slide, Cameron. And you can actually say that the entire book of Hebrews really can be summed up as don't quit. It really is this big encouragement letter. Don't go back. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't forget. It's this call that we need to take seriously, especially when a lot of us feel smashed or feel disheartened or feel discouraged or lost or hurt or confused, that we need each other in each other's lives to notice that look in the eyes, to see that drifting, to, to, to be close enough that we can say, hey, how can I comfort this person? How can I support this person? How can I bear their burden? In what way can I pray for them and with them? How can I put the heart into this brother and this sister who's struggling, who's suffering, who might be ready to quit? So those are at least three ways that we, we encourage each other. Be who we are in Christ. Live as we've been called by him and continue to trust God's goodness. We look at each other and do we, we do whatever we can to put the heart into one another. Now, I've already named something here, but I'm just going to trace it down a little further, if you don't mind. I've already named that I think so much of this encouragement business that we're called to 
as is presented in the Bible, it really is about cheering each other on. It really is about encouraging in the way we often think of it. It's really, really, I think probably 90, 95% of the time, it really is about how do I get alongside you and say, keep going, you're doing great, you look awesome. You, you know, all those things that we need to hear from each other to encourage each other to keep going. But the truth is, as is presented to us in the Bible, it isn't all about cheering each other along the side of the trail. Sometimes it involves throwing ourselves in front of the bus or the trampling herd. That's just true. And I want to talk about that for just a moment. Sometimes to be the encourager that's needed in your brother's life or your sister's life, it involves shouting and flagging them down because they're going the wrong way. It's about acknowledging to them and to ourselves that there really is danger near, that, that we might be running too close to the edge or heading off a cliff. And you need to know, if you've reflected on your own life as I've reflected on mine, I don't like that. I don't like receiving warnings telling me I'm on the wrong track. Do you? Kind of gets my goat a little bit. Am I the only one? who doesn't like being told, I'm going the wrong way? I, I mean, on a trail run, maybe you're glad that someone told you, because, man, it's a pain to go a few kilometers further than you wanted to and then have to backtrack. But in life, when someone says, I am not sure that that's the right thing, or I am concerned about this, am I the only one who gets their hackles up by that? Am I, am I the only one the Spirit is still working on in that? feel a little defensive sometimes. Uh, I don't like it. But the truth is, to really put the heart in each other, to really encourage, yes, we need to encourage one another to keep the way, going the way we've been going. But sometimes we also need to encourage one another by considering the ways we were going that might be wrong. Now, this is certainly true and been true down through history when we think about biblical orthodoxy that there's encouragements and warnings. You see it in the scripture, you see it through history, you see it in our life. That warnings to stick with the Christian faith as we've received it. And that's a challenge when people are, are suddenly kind of playing fast and loose with the divinity of Christ, tossing out the authority of scripture, or maybe starting to decide that some of the basic, even creedal affirmations of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eh. But that's nothing compared to the anger you will receive. If you start... Um, talking to a fellow Christian about the way they're gossiping about other people. It's even more provocative and difficult and fraught and explosive when you challenge a fellow Christian that you love who's not living sacrificially for the kingdom at all. Woo! You want to tick someone off? Go ahead and try that one out for size and let me know how it goes. How about when a friend of yours demeans their spouse verbally? And you say, that is not right. That is not consistent with who you are in Christ. That is not consistent with who God has called you to be. We got to talk about this. Or how about you notice something online from somebody that you know well, and they're communicating in ways that are foul and hateful. Or maybe people are just disregarding the sexual ethics that have been laid down in God's word. I don't know what it is, but man, you want to get people upset? Start waving that flag around. Yes, encouragement is all about helping people love others better. But it also can come down to challenging people to reconcile and forgive, kind of like Paul did to these two women in Philippians 4.2. I can't pronounce either of their names. It's like Iodia and Sintiki. But those two women... Encouragement can be about cheering the new growth on in someone's life and obedience to Jesus, but it, it also can come in the form of hard questions about someone's indifference to spiritual practices or misplaced priorities. Now, I know some of you are thinking already because you're thinking, whoa, that, you just like, that's going to get super judgy. Anyone with me on that? Are you super concerned? Because there's a few, there's always a few among us who think, yes, finally, permission to go and confront someone. <laughs> If that's you, sh shut up. Don't you dare. God is not calling you to confront. If you have any sense of joy in your life that you can go and set someone straight, I want to tell you right now the Holy Spirit is telling you to button it. 
The, this is the word of the Lord. Uh, <laughs> the key is the devotion. So I want to draw back for a moment. The key is devotion. That's what saves us from this ugly judgmentalism. The key is that a brother or sister who is truly devoted, who is striving for, who is eager to honor another, who seeks with everything they got to put the heart into a brother and a sister so that they can live fully who they've been created to be, so that they can explore fully all that God has called them into this worthy calling, so that they can truly be the man and the woman filled with God's spirit who is just flourishing, that that person who then notices, whoa, that is concerning. It is only then. So when I say throw yourself in front of a bus or in front of a trampoline herd a little earlier, I wasn't kidding. This is not the kind of encouragement, this little percentage of encouragement that includes warning, is not the kind of encouragement that's you just lobbing off from the side because it's kind of fun to snipe at people. It's rather from a heart that is filled with love and devotion says, I would die. I would step in front of this person. I would do whatever it takes to help my brother or my sister realize and come alive to all that God has for them. And if that means some hurt and pain, then so be it. I'll take it because I love them. That's not ugly judgmentalism. That's care and concern filled with God's spirit. Now, we need to be attentive to ugly judgmentalism, don't we? Like I said earlier, if you feel like this joyful glee that you get to correct someone, don't. But we also need to embrace our responsibility, which most of the time, 95% of the time, is just getting alongside people to encourage them to keep going. But also recognize there might be times the Holy Spirit says, you need to give a warning here. You need to give a shout out. You need to and prayerfully and, and, and gently and, and with all the grace that you can muster, you need to, to talk to them or write them a letter or, or bring them alongside. I will tell you, it's usually quite painful. Over the years, that's why people often leave the church. You know that? Because uh, they're not willing to hear and respond to what the Holy Spirit might be doing in their lives. That's very, very sad. But it is essential. It's one of the reasons why we encourage spiritual friendships. Because you see, ideally, ideally, when someone confronts me, I think of my friend John, who confronts me on things in my life that are out, uh, off or out, um, we've walked together for so long that I'm going to take him really seriously, right? I'm not, I'm not going to brush him off. I know this guy would die for me. I know this guy loves me. and There's no question in my mind. Um, when we have committed to walking with each other and present in each other's lives, when you've got a spiritual friend that you've agreed to to actually share about your life in Christ and grow in friendship with each other, and that takes time. More and more, you'll be able to receive from a brother or a sister correction from the Holy Spirit. More and more, you'll be able to offer it. But you'll do it in a way that is so guarded with the love and the commitment and devotion you have to one another that you can actually grow and receive it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. May the Lord protect us and lead us in that. As we get toward our close today, I want to ask a couple questions because I think this helps. When you consider your own life, who really puts the heart into you? Who is it? Just I'm, I'm reflecting your own mind uh, right now. Who in your life? Who is? I mentioned my friend John. He does that for me. Uh, my friend Avril does that for me. Tanil obviously does that for me. Um, uh, 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 another uh, friend, Laurel, does that for me. There's people in my life who put the heart into me. Who is it that puts the heart into you? Who is it that's really been an encouragement to you? It could be someone here. It could be someone growing up. But who has been that person for you? Who are those people in your life who really puts the heart into you, really strengthens the way of Christ in you? These core people who are devoted to you, who honor you, who really encourage you, reminding you of what's true and help you keep following Jesus. Who is it? I hope, I hope you can name someone in your mind right now. I hope you can name a person, maybe two or three, who've been a real encouragement to you. Hold on to that. I also think a second question's uh, helpful, and that is what? 
puts the heart into your faith or your trust? In other words, what kind of practices, what kind of things? Uh, for me, reading good, solid, uh, a good, solid theology book puts the heart into my faith. It really does. I love it. Because it, it helps me grow in my understanding of who God is. helps me m- connect more vitally my daily life with my life in Christ, connected to history, connected to the future. It's all, and so there's some good, solid writers. One of them is C.S. Lewis. You big surprise. Um, but I also know that praying with brothers and sisters really helps. I mentioned that I was praying with someone this week who was present in the room, but I won't draw attention to them. And uh, it was such an encouragement to pray with them and have them pray with me. I know for me, one of the things that puts the heart into my faith is this, gathering for corporate worship, hearing brothers and sisters sing to the Lord and, and offer themselves and, and, and this, this sense in which we can, together with one voice, raise praise to the king, which we can't do individually. It's beautiful. It puts the heart. It puts the heart into my faith. What puts the heart into your faith? So you're thinking about the who. You're thinking about the what. I think it's really valuable to consider that for a couple reasons. One is because, first of all, I think we need to be thankful for the people in our lives who've been encouragers to us, right? And so that's the first application today. If you were able to identify who it is that's been an encourager to you, I really want to really call uh, you to, to respond to them somehow. Tell them that. Um, there may be someone from your childhood. There may be someone far away. There may be someone here in this room. But let them know that they have put the heart in you. They have been an encouragement to you. And if there's someone already dead and gone, uh, thank the Lord for them. But be thankful to them and express that gratitude in some way. Also, uh, when you consider some of the practices that put the heart, evaluate, how, how are these practices present in my life? You know, if, if good theological reading puts the heart in you, Make sure you're reading some of that stuff. If, you know, what is it that helps you put the heart into your faith? Make sure that that's present in your life. That's just practical application. But second, we can learn from these things. As we consider those who have encouraged us, as we consider the things that have encouraged us, we can make sure we're doing that for others. We're encouraging others. We're kind of mimicking or practicing some of those same ways that we've been encouraged in others' lives. Because we are to embrace our responsibility as encouragers. That is our responsibility, friends. You and I are responsible to God to encourage one another, to put the heart in one another. And I hope and pray that you'll embrace that responsibility. My third application as I close today is just to reiterate that the purpose of our connect groups is exactly that. To put the heart in each other that we would gather together regularly, that this would become a regular way in which we do life together. Now, I know that there are some of you who heard the call for connect groups, and somehow it was like your eyes just kind of glided right over, your ears, it just bounced, and you thought, that doesn't apply to me. I'd like to just call you on that and say, but it does. You. You should be in a connect group. Anyone just squirming right now just a little bit? I, I, I want to make you squirm just a little bit. The connect groups are all about helping each other get present enough in a regular way that we can actually be that encouraging presence, that we can be putting the heart into one another in our conversations about Jesus, in our conversations about the faith, that we can actually practice this encouragement ministry that God has given each of us, not only in the content that we study, but in the presence of one another as we do it. And so I want to challenge you to take this call to connect groups this fall really seriously. It's one of the ways that we at the Erickson Covenant Church want to put the heart in each other. Let's be encouragers. Let me pray as the team comes up and we lead a final song. Lord Jesus, you are the greatest encourager ever. I mean, you're the one who really put the heart in us. And we are so grateful. And I pray that we, following you, would be a people dripping with encouragement. We do pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us be the kind of people so devoted to one another that we're willing to both cheer one another on as well as warn each other, but to do so with such grace, 
with such love that it protects us from that ugly judgmentalism or that cynicism or that criticism, all that stuff that is just, frankly, from the devil. But rather, that there's such a willingness to grow and listen and engage that, Lord Jesus, our hearts are soft to receive from each other what you have for us and ready <laughs> to be energized by each other's cheering on in this often difficult race. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the author and finisher of our faith. We fix our eyes on you and we run, knowing that we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on, but also that together we're cheering each other on along the way. Make us encouragers, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.